Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Shit Island. Today's a very special episode where we get to talk to the wonderful Apollina Sabrina. You might know her from YouTube where she has a very funny account uh, and she's also done some, uh, some, some voice acting and some, some uh, regular acting on her channel as well as um, Gus Johnson's videos. She appears uh, regularly in those. And uh, you can follow her on at Abelina Sabrina on Twitter and Instagram. And we recommend you do so because she is very funny and she does some very, um, some very enlightening and good content, which we enjoy very much and which we think you would enjoy as well. Uh, we're very happy to, to have her on the show and uh, we had a great time talking with her. So let's get right into it. What do you say, Goat? Do you want to hear the interview we just did with uh, Sabrina? I kind of have stuff to do. Come on, man, we just did it. Yeah, I know, and I, I've already forgotten about it because this is in the past, and so I don't have a memory of it because it hasn't happened yet. Me neither, and that's, yeah, so let's, <laughs> let's all sit back with a cup of tea and, and listen to, to this episode of us where we talk to Sabrina about all things America, Denmark, Sweden, Netherlands, education, healthcare. It's great. It's great. So enjoy and uh, thank you to our patrons, as always. You'll get a special shout-out at the end. And, yeah, enjoy. Here it comes. Oh, hang on. I have to start the episode. Give me a second. God damn it. Hang on. The, the, <laughs> the tape recorder's stuck. Hang on. Oh, no. Oh, my, my, my tape recorder's stuck, too. Fuck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was a terrible intro. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to yet another episode of the Shit Island Podcast, brought to you by Time Zones. <laughs> time Zones. Hey, time and the zone. internet. <laughs> we got to get, give it up for the internet, everyone. This is, this is made possible by a, a donation by the World Wide Web, so let's give it up for, for the internet. Thank you, internet. Uh, through the magic of the internet. We are four people here today from four different countries, uh, able to uh, have a discussion about one of those countries, which is America. Our favorite country in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us here today to, uh, to give us some insight into the state of the most powerful nation in the world is uh, an American herself, Abelina Sabrina, from uh, the Abelina Sabrina YouTube channel. Good morning. Happy to happy to be on here. Thanks for having me, guys. It's a pleasure. Uh, so it's good morning for you. It's about ten a.m. for you. It is uh, seven for us. Just about. <gasps> oh my gosh, that's but, uh, that's me getting ready for bed. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. I went to bed at eight thirty last night. <laughs> oh wow. Do you have to get up early? Usually? No. <laughs> I just. <laughs> I'm one of those people who refer to themselves as morning people. So I've been up since about 4 a.m. my time. I'm not sure what time that would be for you. Wow. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> so you're like uh, in famous inventors and U.S. presidents who get up super early. Actually, yes. I mean, yeah, totally. I think that's a thing that like uh, that's those self-help book things is people who get up early do well or something. Oh, have you read a self-help book, or did um, Jordan Peterson tell you that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, him and I are very close, so it's possible. Of course. We do hang out a lot together. Yeah, we just haven't been able to work out the schedule yet to get him on the show, but it will happen, it will happen. <laughs> we'll make it work. Yeah. Oh, could you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be awful. <laughs> just awful. So, uh, as a politically... Uh, active people. Peter Jules and I like to talk about politics, and as you often do when you talk about politics, is you end up talking about America, since the entire world seems to orbit around America these days, and has done so for the last 30 years. So um, why not talk about some American politics? And a hot topic right now is healthcare. It's the topic of debate for the Democratic primaries, at least, which we have gone over and now want to die and 
So what do you guys, um, how do you guys receive information about um, American politics over here? Oh, it's it's the news. It's <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, our, um, like our state media or like a public subsidized media mm-hmm. talks about American politics and the private media talks about politics. It's in the newspapers, on the radio, on the TV. Uh, and whenever anything big happens, usually involving Trump, it's uh, it's national news here. Yeah, it's, same here. It, it feels like we hear more about what ha- what happens in America than we hear about what's going on in our own countries. <laughs> it does feel like that sometimes, yeah. But I think it's also just because everything America does has such a big impact on what happens everywhere else in the world, and America is so like influential and important that it could just like invade. Any country it would want to. It has the biggest military in the world, and it exports a lot of uh, businesses overseas. And a lot of European and Asian businesses are directly dependent on America. So I think that has a lot to do with it. But also, of course, just the f- the the newsworthiness of the whole Trump circus and everything. No, you're mm. absolutely uh-huh. right about that. Um, I think I just even read this morning that some California pistachio company like lobbies for war and sanctions against Iran just because Iran um, exports a lot of their pistachios? Like, what an awful <laughs> reason to make an enemy with Iran! <laughs> yeah, mm, and big pistachio is in the pocket of big war. <laughs> yeah, and that's the big thing about America is that America can just do that. America can just decide to, go to like, uh, destroy an entire industry in some country if it doesn't feel like doing business with it or if it doesn't feel like buying its products anymore. And that's what is so different as far as I see it from like Denmark or Sweden or the Netherlands or whatever, or like even France or Spain, is they can't just decide to uproot an entire industry the way America can. So there's like this generalized fear towards America and American politics uh, more, and, and morbid fascination from us because we just <laughs> yeah. we have to just kind of play along or respond to what America decides to do and just hope for the best and play ball. That's that's what yeah. we're doing here too. We are just hoping for the best because not many people seem to care as much about getting involved in in politics yeah. over here. Our our voter turnout uh, turnouts are really low. Um, what about for you guys over there? Do people actually? Give a shit about your politics. Uh, I guess <laughs> by American standards, uh, yes, we get voter turnouts of about eighty percent. Oh my god! Yeah, about the same in the <laughs> Netherlands. Yeah, but like that's could be attributed to the fact that at least here in Sweden, I know it's not the case in Denmark or the Netherlands for some bizarre reason. I, as a Swede, I find it uh, incredible. But in Sweden, uh, elections are always on Sundays. So people can always go and vote. They're, they, they're not at work when voting is happening. And voting is always quick. And like it takes 15 minutes to vote and then you can go home. It's not a huge deal to go and vote. So I think that's what contributes a lot to the fact that we have high voter turnout. But I think despite that, many people are still apathetic to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they, they decide maybe in the last week of the election which party to vote for. Then they vote, and then they don't really think about it anymore. And see, even just giving people the time to vote like that on on a Sunday that that makes so much sense. Over here in the U.S., it's always on like a weekday. You know, we have that Super Tuesday coming up um, for California for next year, and it's it's so inconvenient for workers to get out to vote. Like even in California, I think legally. Um, workers are supposed to be allowed to take two hours off from their shift um, to go vote. Like, but even when I worked at Disney, um, our shift leaders would always find little loopholes around it to get us to stay and not vote, trying to tell us to go like before our shift or after our shift. But sometimes it's not as convenient or yeah, it's just there, there's lots of obstacles for for people to get to vote around here. Mm. Can I ask you a question mm. about voting in California, as just out of pure curiosity? No, yeah, absolutely. I was um I was a poll worker for the 2016 election, so I am oh, ready wow. to answer what I can. 
Sweet. Okay, so I know that, or I have, like, uh, am I correct in assuming that pretty much every state has its own laws and, and regulations about how to register to vote and what it entails to register at all? Yes, and it is awful, especially when it comes to primaries. Like, for example, mm -hmm. in the 2016 election uh, for the primaries, New New Yorkers, they had a semi-open primary. Um, so that means if you wanted to vote between um, a Democratic candidate like Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, then you had to be registered as a Democrat or a no party preference. But you had to have been registered for like up to six to eight months prior to the election, which You know, people need that time to decide who they're even going to vote for. Like, who's going to yeah. know who they're going to vote for that early on? I mean, that's great. I mean, unless they were going to vote for Hillary. But they have just <laughs> bizarre laws like that to, to suppress the vote. Yeah. Uh, we, um, I think it was um, in the last episode when we were talking about the Democratic primaries. We actually, I believe we started talking about... Um, voter turnout in the US mm -hmm. and uh, theorized that it was intentional that voting takes place on the weekday and that it's difficult for working people to go out and vote because the intention is that working class people don't vote. Is that a crazy conspiracy theory? It's not a crazy conspiracy theory. It's <laughs> absolutely correct. And I, I don't understand why, especially like the Democratic Party, which is the supposed to be more progressive they continue to have mm. semi-open primaries or even closed primaries in some states so you either have to be registered as democrat no matter like how many months in advance or no party preference but the issue is i noticed that a lot of people think that no party preference and independent mean the same thing because like in media and online mm. that word is used so interchangeably But on paper, the American Independent Party is actually some, like, arm of the right-wing, libertarian type thing. So people were coming to the polls, and they were so excited to vote for Bernie, and they had to get a provisional ballot because they weren't a Democrat or they weren't NPP, no party preference. They were registered to some weird party that actually had no voting power so that's another mm. way i think that people are kind of misled when it comes to to voting yeah so so let's say let's let's make an experiment because i think um in most european countries and i would guess most countries mm -hmm. you are more or less automatically registered to vote if you're a citizen of the country and you just receive something in your mail that says let's go out and vote but that's not as i understand it the case in america let's say if you Let's say, let's make an example. What if I'm an average person who isn't a member of any party and I would like to vote in an election? What would be the, do you know what the typical way that I would register, how, what that would look like? So are you, would you be like a first time voter, never registered at all? Yeah, let's say I'm, I'm uh, 20 something and I'm very passionate about uh, Bernie and I want to vote for Bernie in the primaries, but I'm not a member of, and I live in California and I'm not a member of the Democratic Party. Okay, so first-time voter, you're not registered anywhere, although I think that they're just starting to change the law, where as soon as you turn, like, 16 or when you get your driver's license, like, you're automatically registered. Um, oh. Don't quote me on that, but they're trying, they're trying to fix that. That's very, very new. Um, in California or across in the California. country? In California. Yeah, the rest of the ah, country okay. is <laughs> not so progressive <laughs> with that. But... Um, California also has a semi-open primary, so um, to register as Democrat, which would be the safest just for the sake of the election, um, you would need to be registered by the 15th, the month before the election. Okay, so, so before the primary? Yes. Or, okay, and how do you register? Do you go to a website or do you go to a post office or... So luckily, California system is a little bit more advanced than some other states where you're able to register online. So that part is really easy. Um, you just go to the state website, 
and um, you type in, you know, your name, your contact information, uh, your address, your social, and you could get registered very quickly. And then a few weeks later, the party that you picked will send you um, a confirmation card in the mail. And oddly enough, just I was helping somebody get registered to vote recently, and I was going to show them an example of how to check your voter registration online. And so I searched my name and like I've been registered in the same spot for a while now. Um, I voted in the last election, but it, it seems like I might have been purged from the voter rolls because I couldn't find my registration anywhere at any of my previous addresses or that that's also been an issue lately um, with the last few oh, elections. Wow. That's that's kind of scary if people don't know that they're registered, but they're supposed to be. Yeah, so I would definitely yeah. encourage people, whether they know if they're registered or not, if you can just hop online. It takes like a couple minutes to check your registration because people have been getting um, purged from voter rolls, and it's it's scary. <laughs> yeah, is that done by the party or the state or the government? Or? Um, I think it's done by... I want to say that it's probably done by the parties because the pro uh, the parties are, you know, private entities. They're not technically part of the government. So because mm -hmm. like the, the DNC, for example, they're a private entity, they could choose whether or not like to even acknowledge like your registration or if you vote for a Democratic candidate in the primary with a provisional ballot, um, it's totally up to them whether they even want to count it, which is why um, I think it's really important to register as a Democrat and not just no party preference, just for the safety of getting a real ballot, just because provisional right. ballots are so risky. And a lot of the times, as we saw in 2016, provisional ballots aren't counted. Yeah, there was a big hubbub about that, and a lot of people... Wasn't that also a part of the reason why the uh, Bernie supporters demonstrated at the DNC that year? Yeah, absolutely. They were they were absolutely silenced, and then I don't know how much you guys followed uh, the convention, but they straight up turned the lights off on the Bernie supporters in the crowd, and they, they muted the mics above them, and every time they would, you know, chant something arguing uh, the DNC's decision... Um, the, like if they're shouting like Bernie, Bernie, they'll make like another half of the room go Hillary, Hillary. It was bizarre. I remember Al Franken and Sarah Silverman being very annoyed at people in the back <laughs> and like telling them to shut up. But yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a big mess. No, yeah, that Sarah Silverman time. was telling people to calm down. <laughs> yeah, after their candidate was just screwed out of an election. Absolutely. Yeah. And it just it bothers me so much, especially when like like Hillary supporters from then on tried to or or how should I say this? When after the election, when Hillary lost, Hillary supporters were very quick to blame uh, Bernie Sanders supporters um, from not giving mm, Hillary yeah. that that nomination or even Bernie Sanders himself, because they, they said that he stayed in the race too long. Which, as soon as Bernie lost, he started campaigning for Hillary. It's like people just forgot that piece of history. Yeah, I mean, people are very quick to, to blame Bernie people for uh, not being... Uh, to, or a lot, a lot of people are at least blaming Bernie supporters for not voting for Hillary. But, like, there are some stats that show that more people who voted for, like, Bernie voted for Hillary than Hillary supporters voted for Barack Obama. Exactly. And stuff. So it's like, there's a lot of... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of... of misdeeds going on from both sides if you're just trying to be a party soldier but mm -hmm. it definitely does seem like there's some kind of concentrated effort to to paint bernie supporters as these extremists that just want to topple the government or something absolutely can i just add the whole um registering to vote thing mm -hmm. like i i realized that in, in the primaries it's a different thing but you also have to register to vote in the in the actual election right mm -hmm. yes you have to be registered so, um to vote for the general but i don't think that party um matters as much mm, okay so what's the reasoning behind having citizens manually have to go in and register themselves 
as opposed to just being automatically registered at birth? Uh, I, I wish I, I knew their <laughs> reasoning. If I'd had, if I had to guess why they, they don't want to automatically register people, maybe it's because they think that kids don't know any better, or what, what party would you even assign um, a young person if, if they were to be registered? Because when you're registering, you, you have to pick a party or select no party preference. Um, so I think that oh, that's part that's of it. weird. Yeah, that, that, it's, it's so that you get the, the ballot with all the candidates from your party on it, right? Exactly. They get the proper ballot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I also oh. think, like, I've had this discussion with a, a Republican once, and they said that it was because of privacy concerns, because the, oh. America doesn't have, like, a centralized uh, citizen registry the same way that yeah, a lot yeah. of countries do. Is that, is that correct? What <laughs> on earth? No, we have a census just like everybody else. You have census, you have social security numbers, you have the drafts. I mean, there's a few ways you can find these people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that person was full of... Yeah, okay. Fair Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll always try fair to enough. use, like, their privacy as something to, like, prevent others from voting. Ugh. Mm. Yeah, like, stay out of my yard stuff. <laughs> yeah. So in, in, uh, in Europe, what... What happens is you're automatically registered at birth. You're not assigned a party. You don't have to pick a party, you know, ev ever, except when you're in the voting booth. Uh, when you're 18, you go to the voting booth, you show some kind of proof of who you are. It could be a, a passport, which I believe you can get for free if it's your first one. Uh, Depends on the country, or, and then you've got to pay yeah. for it. But it is like 10 bucks here. Oh, it's like 100 here. It's ten dollars. Yeah, they're pricey here. <laughs> they're pricey over here. Damn, it's pricey here too. Yeah, about I think I shelled over one hundred fifty bucks. <gasps> yeah, huh. it's very cheap here to get a new passport, or you can get an ID from your bank, which uh, it's uh, about the same price, ten twenty dollars. Either way, you have to show some kind of proof of who you are, and then you just get presented with a bunch of ballots, and you pick which party you want to vote for. You go into the voting booth. You put an X in front of the candidate that you want to vote for, and then you put it in a in an envelope, and that's it. Yeah, roughly speaking, that's the same in the Netherlands. I don't fully understand the purpose of having to register with a specific party before you're at the polling station or at the voting location. I wonder if they do that to like to try and make sure that true Democrats are voting. In in a sense, like I guess they don't want people for some reason just like. I don't know if they think that it's going to spoil their votes or something, or if people are going to come in and, like, troll their vote somehow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah. That, yeah, that's I don't, bizarre to me, too. I, yeah, I don't... Th this might be... Yeah, this might be my conspiracy theory, but I don't think America was ever really set up to be a fully-fledged democracy. Seems oh. like... Uh, who said that famous line about how, like, uh, America isn't a democracy, it's a republic, or something like that? <laughs> like, it's a... It's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like a like a democracy like i remember during the mm. midterms this last midterm season they had record turnout and it was still i think hovering at below 50 percent and so many polling stations just had to close early because they didn't have enough paper like they're not preparing for people to actually go out and vote they just kind of give an estimate and then kind of like say in the ballpark we're going to need this many ballots and like it doesn't it doesn't seem like the system is set up like it seems like if everyone showed up to vote at an american election it wouldn't work essentially yeah. <laughs> no yeah absolutely when i had training to um work like the the polls um for the 2016 election they really just kind of went over like the basics and like voter rights and stuff and that's fine but they don't tell you what to do when stuff goes wrong like if the little because some some polls have electronic machines instead of paper ballots, so that's a whole other issue. But what if one of the mm. machines breaks down? Or what if you can't give people a code to go to go vote? Like, there's so many little issues. And if one of those goes wrong, you know, these are all volunteers who are working these polls. And so, like, that actually happened to me. We had one of our printers go down, and people couldn't get their voters' receipts. And so people were coming oh, in wow. to vote, and they were telling me, like, why are you suppressing my right to vote? And I'm like, it's not me, I swear. And so we're calling, like, 
the local Democratic Party to send somebody to help us. And we were just down for a few hours. So for some people, that was the only window that they had that day to vote. And the other thing is you Mm. have to vote at your registered polling center. You Mm -hmm. cannot go anywhere else. It doesn't matter where you work. It has to be the one closest to your home address that was selected for you. So that's another dumb issue. Right. And then you have states like Georgia, which shut down, what was it, a third of all their polling stations in inner city? Uh, Georgia's election is so fucking disgusting. (laughs) Yeah, that was a real bizarre thing to follow. Yeah, Yeah, the the guy who was running for election oversaw his own election. It's insane. (laughs) Uh, He purged like 10% of the voting rolls, surprisingly like 80% of which were black people. (sighs) Wonder why. Wonder why. (laughs) <laughs> that election was disgusting. Oh follow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Which is which is the state that still has the Confederate battle standard on their state flag? Yeah. Mississippi. Missouri. I think Mississippi. Mississippi. One of the southern states. Mm. I think most That's, of them have uh, some variation of Confederate symbols on their flags, don't they? Yeah, Georgia has the the state flag of the Confederacy, which is the the red, white, red barge flag thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. The blue thing in the corner. With the European flag in the corner. Not to be mean to oh, the yeah. Confederacy. <laughs> it was a states' rights thing. Oh, the uh, yes. Yeah. You really feel for them. Really feel for them. <laughs> you do. So, uh, um, maybe we should move on to healthcare. Oh, boy. That's a big thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. I, uh, so, in, in Sweden, um, the, the <clears throat> it's really complicated. What you do when you're sick is you. Uh, you go to the hospital, you get treated, and then you go home. And in America, you have Medicare, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act, which is Obamacare, Medicare for All, which is a proposed one, uh, single payer, uh, you have private medical insurance, and you have private hospitals. You also have the Veterans Affair uh, healthcare thing. That's... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's like the medical care for veterans. Thing. Yes. How do you keep track of everything? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that's the point, to make it as confusing as possible so that people just kind of accept what's thrown at them. Um, Most people Mm. over here get their insurance from their employers. Why Mm. their insurance is tied to their employment is beyond me, but they do. And... Even if they do, you know, get their insurance from their employers, they still have to pay um, monthly for Mm -hmm. monthly premiums for their insurance. They have to pay co-pays when they get, you know, to the front desk. And then depending on what sort Mm -hmm. of um, plan they have, they may have to to pay like for their labs, for their imaging, for their procedures, for the hospital facilities. Like it's there's there's so much going on. And I think it's it's done intentionally to make it as confusing as possible so people just <laughs> accept it and they don't realize how much they're getting robbed just for getting sick or trying to prevent getting sick. How do you then, like, as someone who is voting Democratic, how do you analyze the Democratic field in terms of this? Because from, like, a shallow point of view, it seems like pretty much every Democrat if they could have their way with complete power, they would, you know, design some kind of um, Medicare for all system. But it it doesn't seem that way when you then really dig into what they're saying. Like, who do you think is, is, do you think that they're all really for it? Do you think they'd all fight for it? Or are there people that you think would be more at the forefront of trying to design such a system? I definitely don't think the Democratic establishment is for Medicare for all at heart. Mm -hmm. Um. They're trying to phrase it as, we fought so hard for Obamacare, and now you're just going to slap it in the face? That is a disgrace. And it's... (laughs) Yeah. Joe Biden did that. Exactly. Um, (laughs) Which, you know, he's the perfect example of the Democratic establishment. Um, Yeah, I I, I truly just, I do not think that they they want Medicare for all, because a lot of these top Democratic... um, bodies they they take money from the healthcare industry whether it's you know like big pharma or big insurance companies so they don't actually want to see it go you know that they're very 
neoliberal in a sense where they don't think that it should be a public service. They they want it to be mm. privatized as well, but they want there to be a public option where people can have right. access. But access doesn't mean anything. You have access to go, you know, buy a new car or something, but it doesn't mean that you can afford to actually pay for it after. And this is not me like comparing like health insurance to cars. Obviously, health <laughs> insurance is much more important. Right. Yeah. But it does seem like there is some effort to, as you mentioned, the neoliberal establishment, it does seem like there is some effort by them to kind of rebrand Medicare for all to be this Medicare for all asterisk thing, where it's like you, you be like, yeah, Medicare for all, except for these people, or like, except for this type of condition. Except like for if the you, Boston if you just, bomber. Yeah, the, if the Unabomber shouldn't be <laughs> allowed to get therapy. But no, but, uh, they actually yeah. use that as an example as to why Medicare for all shouldn't be a thing. Like they'll draw these contrasts between like, you know, a, a normal person and somebody who did something awful like the Boston bomber. Like it's, it's, it's the way that they're trying to frame the argument and people just eat it up. Mm. I think it was a uh, Klobuchar who did, who said uh, during the, one of the primary debates, like uh, tuition free college is good in theory, but are we really going to pay for rich kids' college yes. tuition? <laughs> Why yes. not? <laughs> yes, we are, because the, the fact of the matter is, is that their parents, who are obviously rich, they, they mm -hmm. paid the taxes to also, you know, make that a possibility. And to be honest, those rich kids, they're probably going to go to a private college anyway, but they should have the option to go to public school just like everybody else. Right. Yeah. Right. So I was thinking uh, private in medical insurance. Mm -hmm. Do they have complete and total freedom to decide what they will cover and what they will not? I think there are some regulations, but depending on what plan you get, they will deem stuff, even if it is medically necessary, as not a covered benefit. And I don't know as much as to, like, what they have to cover. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I have heard horror stories of like people with uh, pre-existing conditions mm -hmm. trying to get insurance and no one will give it to them because they know this person is going to be in the hospital a lot, so they're going to cost a lot of money, but he's not going to give them insurance. No, absolutely. That has happened. And I think it happened um, predominantly before Obamacare came into play, because um, prior to Obama being in office, I think that was um, a lot... Uh, more it was happening a lot more but the thing is and i i'm sorry if this makes me sound like conspiracy theory like but companies you know they have the option to buy like people's like online data if they want to and it's it's a little scary because i feel like that data can and probably is going to be used in the future as a way to get around that where they could deny someone coverage if they're like looking up a lot of like pregnancy stuff or something along those lines i, I mean think... we love conspiracy theories so please do <laughs> indulge us if you have any uh, i think like, apple uh... has actually experimented with that uh, they did some experience where they got the anonymized uh patient details at some hospital yes. and then just linked it with people in that area and were able to figure out with these people which is mm -hmm. kind of fucking terrifying really right. mm -hmm. also what and the fuck's some hospital doing selling their fucking patient data to Apple. Yeah, they think just because, <laughs> like, they, like, strip the identifying information that it can't be, like, rehashed together, it's... Yeah, you're, you're, you're totally right. I mean, it doesn't sound like a conspiracy theory at all at this point, so... <laughs> no, no, just, no, just, I just be the surprised. world. Just the world we live in. Yay. Just America. So if you could design your perfect Medicare for all system in America, what would you would you say that it should all go over the the taxes or it should all be like the Swedish system where you can just walk in and like do do you, do you think that there is any argument to not uh just directly implement the Swedish system in America? Well, when it comes to Medicare for all, I think cuz people who have Medicare, you know, 65 and above, 
they like their coverage. They like their doctors. They like that their their doctors aren't limited to whatever insurance you know they have because Medicare has to be accepted. So I am fully in support of Bernie Sanders' proposal to just expand that to everybody. And maybe it comes at like a small hike in taxes, but people don't realize is that you're not going to pay co-payments anymore. You're not going to pay these ridiculous monthly premiums. You're not going to have these um, deductibles that are impossible to meet. And they're going to be paying less than they currently are. And I think People don't get that um, the way that it's it's phrased when you hear about it on on the news. Um, I don't know as much about the Swedish system. I mean, it sounds really complicated. Go to the hospital when you're sick and then go home. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does yeah, take no, uh, it, it does take a bunch of explaining to, to to get behind that kind of logic. But yes, it is. Yeah. So yeah. basically, what happens is uh, once a month, you you have to uh, do these things called taxes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, it's basically money that you pay to the government, and then the government actually owns hospitals and pays doctors. Okay, slow down. And because you've you've paid those so-called taxes, you can just go there, and it, it like you, you I mean you can just be there, and then you you can be like, hey doctor, my arm fell off, and the doctor will you know glue your arm back on, <laughs> and it'll be free. Wait, you can just glue arms back on in Sweden? That's awesome. I'm. I'm yeah, jealous of everything uh, I'm hearing here. Group. I'm very jealous. I don't know. It sounds like you're stealing that doctor's labor. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of does, yeah. That's uh, a I think Ben Carson literally made that argument that, or might be Ben Carson, could be wrong, but it made that I argument heard ben of like, Shapiro you know. say that recently. Uh, probably as well, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, having this universal health care, you know, like slavery is like, hmm. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Those poor doctors forced. Forced at gunpoint to heal people. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah what does the world uh, come to? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I w this might be a silly question, but are all hospitals in the United States privately owned? Um, I'm trying to. I know there are like charity and non-profit hospitals and stuff, but like, are there like federally or state-owned hospitals as well? Because we almost exclusively have those. That's that sounds so bizarre to me. I'm thinking of all the hospitals that I've ever passed, and yeah, they're all privately owned. Um, I'm trying to think, maybe like the VA for for veterans. I think they have yeah, there's a run state owned, yeah. But aside from that, you know, we we still have like um, like clinics like Planned Parenthood. But full-on hospitals? Well, I guess even Planned Parenthood is private, isn't it? Yeah. Um, huh. No, yeah, you're <laughs> right. They're, they're all private. And it's, it's awful. Like, if somebody needed to have, you know, a, a surgical procedure, they have to factor in, um, in regards to cost, they have to factor whether the doctor is in their insurance network, whether the facility or the hospital is in their network, and whether the anesthesiologist is in their network. So that's three things that mm. they have to hope fit together. And a lot of the time, they don't. So people, you know, even though they think that they're covered, they'll get surprised with these bills after for thousands of dollars. And it turns out the hospital wasn't in network. It's, it's weird, these, yeah. these backroom contracts that they all have with each other. So it's like it a gym really membership. Essentially, <laughs> like you have to hope if you go to a new city that they have your gym or else you just can't use the gym. I've totally mm -hmm. canceled the gym membership and it definitely wasn't because I never went. It was that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it sounds really bizarre as someone who has never, you know, had to be treated in a hospital in, in America. Like the, just the medical system is so... Convoluted. It, yeah, <laughs> it is, and it, there are so many like loopholes. And but I think the most bizarre thing is that hospitals are for-profit businesses. Yep. Like they make money by making like saving people from dying. Oh, they make so much money. And like patients have to. Not only do patients have to pay to not die, 
but they have to pay even more than that so that whoever owns the hospital will get money. Yep, sounds about right. That just doesn't, that's just not a thing (laughs) here. (laughs) Um, Back in October of just last year, I had an issue in my, my lower abdomen that I repeatedly went to the doctors for, and I went to multiple doctors within my network, Kaiser Permanente, and they Shout kind out. of just kept telling me, oh, you're just having female problems. Take some Tylenol and go home. <laughs> but it turns out um, I had a cyst rupture on my fallopian tube, and so I was oh. bleeding internally for five days until finally a doctor took me seriously, and once they saw how much blood had collected, they immediately sent me to surgery, and thankfully, you know, I survived, but I looked at my explanation of benefits after, and I'm, I'm so, so fortunate that I have good insurance out here from my mom, because she works for Los Angeles County, But I looked at my explanation of benefits, and if I did not have insurance, then my surgery, which I didn't even really have a choice in the matter of, because it was either that or die, um, my surgery was going to be $50,000. Right. That's... That's insane. That's so scary about the about the cyst too, especially because I think we've all been in situations or know people who've been in situations where, where you go to the doctor repeatedly mm-hmm. and they don't take you seriously. And like then to also have the, the, the bill come in afterwards if you're not insured properly must just be so earth shaking for and so many people go through it, too. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just always wondering how do people who then get that major bill that you hear about, like how do they get out of it? How do they, like, is there any way that you can, like, apply for a, a suspension of the, of the payment from the government if, you're, if you don't have any money and it's an emergency surgery? Or is it just on you to pay for the, the surgery? Do you know? No, the government doesn't really help you at all in that situation. You have to kind of beg for some sort of financial forgiveness from the hospital. If they think they can get even a fraction of that money out of you, then they'll insist on setting up these payment plans that some people, you know, are are never actually going to be able to pay off or they'll probably be paying for the rest of their lives. Um, sometimes, depending on your income, hospitals will um, hospitals will waive some of the amounts, but they still expect you to to pay whatever you can. Um, very rarely do I see uh, charity cases. And I I used to work um, at a company called the Oregon Clinic. So I saw from time to time uh, rare cases of, of, of charity, but it, it takes a lot of going back and forth because you have to have the doctor sign on that he will do the, he or she will do the surgery for free. You have to have the hospital say that they'll do it for free and the anesthesiologist. So again, you have to, get permission from all these moving parts and if one of them says no then you're out of luck Hmm. that's such a crazy system again like it's (laughs) it does it does sound like it does sound a little bit like like we're just asking you these these basic questions to be like your system's weird but it it is weird like it doesn't it doesn't seem in any way like it's like that's how any normal people would design a system in 2019 like even hardcore republicans given the options looking at how expensive the system is, probably wouldn't then still agree to set up that system from the bottom up if they had to do it over again, do you think? Uh, well, I think, I think that the system is kind of working exactly as it was planned to work. Mm. I don't think that um, they actually have people's lives in, in mind when, when um, thinking of of uh, affordability, um, especially yeah. with Republicans. I, I very much do not think that they're pro-life as much as they're just kind of pro-birth because these are people's <laughs> lives being ruined by these, you know, hospital costs. And it's one of the leading causes of bankruptcy here in the U.S. Um, right, yeah. It's What's that uh, quote? Uh, 
the uh, the fundamental Republican truth is that life begins at conception and ends at birth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it does seem like such a good way to describe it that they're pro birth, like they're just huge fans of people giving birth. Because again, it just uh, it doesn't seem like if they then give birth to people who are now it just seems like I'm shitting on America. I'm sorry, uh, but yeah, it's it's a weird system. It's like well, yeah, America, the country, and and the American people are lovely. <laughs> it's really oh, evil, thanks. and like you deserve better. <laughs> but like yes, yes, don't vote that's, for Biden. That's the angle we got. <laughs> Don't vote for Biden. We're not going to endorse Biden uh, on this show. Do you think he'll be the nominee? Like, just from a, a purely <laughs> cynical point of view? I think that it's very possible that he could be the nominee. And I think mm -hmm. that it would be a result of um, Warren and Bernie splitting the progressive vote. I do think that Bernie has more of a chance to win. I, I mean, I have high hopes for Bernie. I'm actually in talks with the Bernie Sanders campaign um, to help them oh, wow. in Southern California. So I actually attended um, a barnstorm event with the campaign yesterday. Um, That's awesome. I know, yeah. it's so cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, Do you get to meet him? I think if I, if I end up getting the job, then I, I would hope so. But right now we're just kind of um, in talks just because they do want to get more of a movement in uh, Southern California with the Latina community. Mm, cool. Yeah. What do you think our chances are of getting him on the podcast? Just <laughs> curious. I don't know. Apparently he's doing YouTube podcasts now. So that is chances true. probably that good is as true. ever. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he would go on a podcast if he knew it was called Shit Island. Mm. Or maybe he'd be his if he, if his advisors or like you could convince him no pressure that we're like a cool. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> to be fair, I, I can see him going on Come Town. <laughs> yeah, probably. Let's get him on Chapel. Yeah, Let's that. get him on Chapel. Mm. That seems like a logical step for his campaign. That would be actually. Uh, so I have some immigration questions, and these are all pretty basic questions. <laughs> In case she wants to move to Sweden, or <laughs> uh, it yeah. sounds appealing. Feel free. It does. I'm moving to Sweden. <laughs> the, there's a giant wall, basically, between the US and Mexico. Like, in, Euro in European standards, where there are no borders, there is a massive border between the US and Mexico. Is it as difficult to cross the Canadian border as it is to cross the Mexican border? Well, I've, I've crossed both those borders, but I'm a US citizen and I carry my passport, and... Like, I, I noticed that Canadian officers, as I was trying to enter Canada, were actually kind of mean. I was so surprised because Canadians are <laughs> notoriously nice. But I guess it's it's only after you get into the country or if they're visiting you. But <laughs> their border is pretty tight. They don't mess around. At least the Americans. Cops. Yeah. Um, I do. I have read that. Canada ranks number one in the world in terms of like accepting foreigners. Um, so that's good at least because I in the U.S. for example, um, our border. Yes, we have that stupid border fence, um, but the I, politicians are acting as if that's the only way that people come to the u.s people fly sometimes there's oh, yeah. boats no. <laughs> or people just you know come on their visas and then they'll just yeah. stay past stay. the the period which i mean i personally don't have a problem with but i know that in the eyes of the law that's illegal um but that's why the the actual border between the u.s and mexico is more of a a symbol yeah it, it, it's political uh uh, I don't know, hand waving. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot easier to just say build a wall than reform the immigration system <laughs> of the federal uh, government. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Reform that federal immigration system. <laughs> just Sensible just reform now. Uh, I also had a question about Puerto Rico. Okay. Which, which I know is a, a, is a U.S. territory. Spoilers. <laughs> But I've seen a lot of Americans, and it might just be biased because uh, I guess like late night shows or whatever like to show off 
oh, look at these uh, stupid people or whatever. But do the majority of Americans know that Puerto Rico is part of America? Honestly, I really don't think that a lot of people realize that Puerto Rico is an American colony. They just assume that that's part of like Latin America and they don't think it's part <laughs> of the U.S., even though it totally is. They just don't have as many rights or, or voting rights as as we do, which is yeah. bizarre. There, there are three million people mm -hmm. there and they are Americans born in America, but they can't vote for president. Yep. And they do have a representative in Congress, but it's a non-voting representative. <laughs> well, what's the use of it then? <laughs> it's just someone Symbolic. there to like look at how you know other people vote. Yeah, it's a congressman from Puerto Rico who sits in Congress and then doesn't do anything. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> but so I uh, like, how is Puerto Rico ever going to get statehood if? Most Americans don't even know that it's like not a state or that, like, that it's part of America, but not a state. I don't know how soon that will come. I think that a lot of Puerto Ricans do want that statehood and recognition. Um, but I mean, if Americans didn't even pay it, like not Americans, but like if those Americans in the continental U.S. didn't, you know, seemed to care when Puerto Rico was going through that period of time where they were hit by that storm and they just didn't have mm. straight up power for months. Like if, if that doesn't yeah. get you to recognize, you know, your fellow citizens, I don't know what it's going to take. Yeah. It, w it was so interesting when that hurricane happened because mm -hmm. uh, if you compare Puerto Rico and Cuba, who are very close to each other, mm -hmm. Both were hit by the hurricane. Cuba recovered in like five days. Mm -hmm. And Puerto Rico, it took months because they just, the, the US government just forgot about them, it feels yeah. like. That is when, like it, it, while we were doing, it just uh, took a while. <laughs> yeah, while we were doing the unenviable task of going through all the uh, candidates, uh, primary candidates' platforms, one thing I've noticed is um, a few of them have like a thing on like statehood for Washington, D.C. No mention of yeah. Puerto Rico. <laughs> no mention Puerto of Rico Puerto Rico doesn't exist in a lot of these like platforms, but do you see? Yeah, that will be a state. Uh, there's like half a million people. Sure, it should be a state or incorporated or whatever, you know. But Puerto Rico, three million people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't really hear a lot of the candidates talk as much about Puerto Rico. I know I've heard like, and maybe this is just my bias because I pay attention to them a little bit more, but I feel like Bernie had made statements on it and um, AOC, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she's Puerto Rican. So she, off least, um, she obviously was very vocal about that during that time as well. But other than that, silence. So AOC, was she born in Puerto Rico? Was she born in the continental US? I believe she was born in New York. Okay, because if she was born in Puerto Rico, she would have to go through like the immigration process to be allowed to be sit in Congress, I think. I think, aren't you, if you're born in the territory as an American citizen, if you have a No, because you, you can't vote for president. No, you can't, you can't, like, your votes don't matter. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't you still born an American citizen if your parents are American or from the territory? Oof, I this is getting into legalities. Because so. <laughs> uh, theoretically, if you're born on American soil, all, you should have all of the rights that the American Constitution guarantees. Like the to Rock, you, but I don't think the Rock was born in Samoa, and he's he was born an American citizen. I know embarrassing facts. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think that is true. I think he could also get dual citizenship. I'm not totally sure um, about how it goes in Samoa, but um, no, I, I I do think that's true. I know that um, my younger siblings. My dad, he has American and Mexican citizenship, and then he went on to have more children in Mexico, and they're able to get U.S. citizenship. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> since, uh, in your opinion, most people don't know that Puerto Rico is part of the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, I am going to assume that most people also don't know about American Samoa or Guam or the Northern Mariana Islands or the U.S. Virgin Islands, where, like, 
hundreds of thousands of people live. And I feel like no one ever talks about them either. Yeah, you don't really hear about that at all. The only time I ever hear anything about Samoa is uh, when the Girl Scouts come around and they sell those cookies and they have one called like Samoa's. But other than that, nobody, <laughs> <laughs> nobody talks about the islands. Are the Samoan mm. cookies good? Do you know? I gotta say, they're awesome. They're... Good. They're, they're very good. Good. Wait, do you guys get Girl That's Scout good. cookies where you are at all? No. No. We don't get Girl we Scouts. We have Girl Scout cookies. Yeah, we have we Girl do. Scouts? Oh, yeah. <laughs> scouts are huge here. Oh, yeah. Oh, we don't have them at all. We, we, don't have we barely have Scouts <laughs> at all. We don't Girl Scouts. The Scouts are rocking out here. We had Scouts up until like the 70s, I think, and then for some reason we... Didn't anymore. Because you had to pay for your passport <laughs> prices. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, American education. Mm -hmm. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> Give us the lowdown. Does it exist? <laughs> like, <laughs> what, what could you plan? estimate the percentage of public schools versus private schools? Like, middle schools and high schools? Well, there's definitely a lot more, um, public schools than private schools. Um, they're starting to transition more to charter schools, which I've seen a lot lately, yeah. but I still think that public schools kind of, um, dominate if we're talking numbers. Now, just the charter schools are private, right? Like they're privately yes. owned and run schools. Yes. Yeah. And, and especially actually in California, I've heard you have a lot of uh, public schools being changed into or transformed into charter schools. Um, by the Democrats uh, in in California, are you up to date on on what's happening with that? Or um, I hear a little bit about it, not not as much, but I do hear that charter schools kind of put um, children from like low income families at a disadvantage um, mm -hmm. because it mm -hmm. kind of takes resources away from the public schools in the area. Um, because they charter schools do get money from from the government, and yeah, yeah. So it's 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 un ugh, it's unfortunate for public schools because they already are just so low funded. I don't know what classroom sizes are for you guys back from grade school, but from middle school to high school over here in my public school, our classrooms were between like. 40 to 50 kids on average. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. It's about 15 to 20 here. <laughs> 20 to 30 in the Netherlands, uh, at least in my experience. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's, uh, so yeah. you mentioned that you've gone to public schools. So you, you come from a public school background. Do you like what was what was that like? Did you have friends who went to private schools and did you did you notice or did you did you feel a certain way because you went to public school or is it um or was it just more or less the same for for kids? Uh I went mm. to public school for, you know, K through 12. Um a lot of people in my high school they they came from the private middle schools whether it was owned by like the Catholic Church or um like maybe a that's, local charter that's school weird thing. Oh. <laughs> um but a lot of people were very very happy to be in a public school system because um the private one was a lot more strict and sometimes they would take like certain types of punishment into their own hands which right. oddly enough mm. students didn't love oh <laughs> who'd have thunk <laughs> big yeah. if true that's the same reputation they have here too. Uh, Catholic schools being very strict and very old-fashioned in the way that they deal with it. So you're saying they they you came have Catholic from schools in Denmark? Tons of Catholic schools. Oh yeah, really? Sub-Catholic church. Do you even have Catholics? <laughs> we have tons of Catholics. Oh yeah, I'm surprised Catholic with this information as well, guys. I'm surprised. We have we have entire <laughs> cities where it's illegal to drink outside. Um, where you can't show oh, any yeah, bottles of alcohol. Oh yeah, we have a, a sizable. What's up, Danish Catholic community? Shout out! <laughs> wait, wait, uh, like you can't drink outside, like on a sidewalk, or like you can't drink outside, like no. if a restaurant has a patio. 
you can't drink at all. It's like you can't order beer, you can't order alcohol, you can't walk around with a bottle of beer or anything. It's, it's totally like an American movie with like the the uh, the bag outside the the bottle <laughs> oh, if you want to yeah. drink alcohol in public. Oh yeah, that's a total thing some places here. Yeah. Wow. Wow. But anyway, yeah. So so Catholic schools have much the same reputation in in Denmark. Are you saying that there are public Catholic schools or they came from private Catholic schools? Uh, I think the Catholic schools are private. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. Yeah. So, what, what what were the backgrounds generally for the this this people in your classroom in the public school? So I come from an East Los Angeles neighborhood of Montebello, and it is primarily a Hispanic. So, like ninety percent plus was Hispanic. We also had a small Armenian community. Like I could probably count on my fingers how many like white kids we had um <laughs> and then a few black students but very predominantly hispanic mm. Mm. is your experience that it it's the school system in los angeles as my my gut feeling tells me it, that it's still very segregated in terms of uh both race ethnicity but also money and uh socioeconomic background oh Definitely in terms of money. Um, I think like within my my high school that people definitely um, hung out. Like the groups were very diverse. So I, I did love that about my high school. But at the rival high school down the road, um, they did have like a very high um, Asian population. Um So that was something that we noticed and that their school was, you know, just like a little bit nicer than ours. Um, so right. they were kind of like on the on the richer side of of town. Um, and oddly enough, quick story, the rival high school, they won some sort of radio contest to have Ariana Grande perform at the high school. And so on the day of the concert, everybody was so excited that she was coming to Montebello. And before she went on stage, she was tweeting stuff like, "Ugh, this place is so ghetto. I want to get out of here before I get shot or something along those lines. And so when she came she out, was. everybody was so upset and they were booing her. And <laughs> and then she left very quickly. But it's like, that's the nice high school. That's the nice side of town. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> that's wonderful. It does seem like a very Ariana Grande, Mariah Carey, diva thing to do just tweet out something nasty about the place you're just about to perform at and not even wait until afterwards not good crowd work to be and honest not is, good crowd work i'm pretty sure that she's of like latin descent as well so i was super duper surprised that she would do that for her community I mean, it's not very compassionate uh, to a community that's probably going through a lot to just straight up say that they're awful. Uh, oh yeah, she's, she's out of touch. Canceled. <laughs> I think that's a very safe, a very safe statement to come with that Ariana Grande is out of touch with the general American <laughs> population. <laughs> um, and I agree. Yeah. So um, back to education. <laughs> oh right. Yeah. <laughs> What? We're not gonna keep talking about Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande is education here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, her new album was pretty good. I'll give her that. Some bangers on there. Education. So in in Sweden, to become a teacher in high school, you have to go through about six years of uh, education in pedagogy, as well as in the specific subject or subjects that you're going to be teaching to the kids, and you learn about the different theories of learning and how kids are supposed to learn. And the oldest one in recorded history, I guess, but the oldest one that, that we've ever used is the Pavlovian theory, which is mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the dogs with the bell and the food, mm -hmm. if you've ever studied psychology. Right. Um, which is basically rewards and punishment. Uh, and that applied to the school system. So when a student does something good, you reward them. When they do something bad, you punish them. That's the, the, like, when we learn about that, we're told, like, this is the ancient way of doing things. 
in my experience, that's how they still do things in America. Am I incorrect? No, yeah. Because we tend to um, focus more on the individual student and focus on helping them grow and be creative with how they learn and, and basically never issue punishments unless it's really, really warranted. No, yeah. Um, students definitely get punished very, very quickly um, if, you know, something goes wrong or if maybe they're their grades are slipping in a certain class, you know, they're very quick to get a detention or Saturday school or get sent to the principal's office. Like, even our school counselors weren't um, much help. Doesn't it feel counterproductive to punish people who aren't doing as well in school? Because when you punish them, surely they're not just going to suddenly be more productive, they're just going to be more depressed. Absolutely. And so when these children get you know detention they're not even doing anything in detention they're literally just being forced to sit there until they're allowed to leave like there's nothing productive about it it's just straight punishment yeah we we don't have detention what like at all what? <laughs> we just don't have them because i think we realize they don't do anything and so we were like, well, if they don't do anything, there's no point in enforcing students to go to detention. Did you guys see that one little video floating around about this school that's trying to implement, like, meditation in replacement of, like, a detention-like thing for students who are maybe acting out or if their grades are slipping or something where they have to take, like, mandatory meditation instead? Yeah, it sounds a bit pretentious <laughs> but perhaps a step in the right direction i know that david lynch has this foundation where he goes out to public schools and teaches kids transcendental meditation and stuff and like some schools uh. begin each day with meditation uh and like apparently it's been really good for like student interaction and participation and stuff oh huh, that's interesting well, i think just just having a kinder attitude towards students in general and treating them as human beings instead of just sacks of meat that you need to force to do standardized oh, tests. tests like the students hate it the teachers hate it nobody likes standardized tests and it's ridiculous that these test scores that the students you know get every year determines how much funding that their school will get that's completely oh, yeah, that's, unfair that's crazy yeah we uh, our schools get funding based on how many students there are <laughs> and in schools in uh, certain uh, areas which are determined to be troubled, so mm -hmm. in poverty, for instance, they get uh, extra funding. Yeah, what a same concept. Here. The performance of the students is not a factor at all. <laughs> and um, this part uh, might shock you. We have tests on average about once every two years. Two years? What? Yeah. Huh. Uh, they're called the national tests, and they don't determine your grade. They are entirely like a census, as a way for the government to gauge how well the students are doing. So we just don't have tests. Wow, if you do badly on your <laughs> annual exams here, you could repeat that grade. Oh yeah, no, we don't repeat grades really at all. That's... Either. <laughs> This is what I'm saying about American, the American education system being basically 50 years behind the rest of the world, or at least behind Europe. At least behind Sweden, because Just... we still have a lot of those tests as well, and some of them will absolutely determine your future. Well, we, we, we've been learning recently that the Netherlands is a bit behind yes, Europe as well. Yes, we are. We are. We think we're ahead. We are far behind. I do want to ask yeah. you guys, do your public schools provide free lunch for the students or is that something that students are expected to pay for or the students parents 